welcome to the Intuitive Insights podcast series. I'm Nina Lockwood, founder and director of Intuitive Interim and Executive Search. Throughout this series, I will be sharing engaging conversations with talented leaders from across the UK transport sector. For all of those already familiar with my Intuitive Insights podcast, you will know that over the last few weeks, I've been enjoying the company of some of the senior leaders in the UK rail industry who have been sharing their career stories, their thoughts on what to come in terms of the opportunities for the sector, and also um, some uh, amusing anecdotes. Today's podcast is a little bit different in that I'm joined by a very special guest, uh, someone I have known for just over 10 years and who I consider to be a very special friend. Um, Jane is with us to talk about a subject which will be of interest to everyone in the industry. She is a powerhouse on the female empowerment stage. She's spent the last 20 years working with women and teenage girls, so her voice has credibility and validity and her passion for potential is contagious. Jane is a serial entrepreneur, a coach, an author, a speaker, a game changer, and the CEO of Girls Out Loud, a social enterprise that she founded 10 years ago on a mission to raise the aspirations of teenage girls. She is an audacious commentator, a pioneer, and a woman of gumption. It's one of my favorite words. Jane is a role model to many and an inspiration to everyone who meets her. And if you haven't yet seen Jane on the stage speaking, then you really ought to because she is totally inspirational. Jane is one of the most knowledgeable people I know on the subject of female empowerment. Um, She's not going to ask us to burn our bras or chain ourselves to the railings. She really does understand the issues and the challenges that women face in life as well as in the workplace. And I've asked Jane to join me on this special edition of Intuitive Insights to give us some practical advice for those organisations and the people within it who are responsible for diversity and inclusion. Jane has some really important messages around the subject of gender. We've only got half an hour today, so we will skim the surface, I'm sure, in terms of what can be done differently. But I am going to share Jane's contact details. So if you want to continue the conversation after you've heard what she's got to say, her contact details will be available. Jane, welcome to Insights. It's a delight to see you. Um, Big intro there, big intro, but that's all I want to say because I'm keen that we have as much time in the next half hour to hear from you in relation to um, the work that you've done, the thoughts that you have and the practical advice that you've got um, for my railway family colleagues in terms of how they can work towards a better balanced workforce. Okay, cool. Look forward to doing that. So where should we start? (laughs) I think one of the things which um, which people are are increasingly talking about in the need, is the need to have role models in the organisations that they work for and uh-huh. in the industry that we're in. The rail industry is is no surprise and no secret. It's a very uh, male dominated industry uh, because of its history, and um, and I think one of the things that we, we, we are recognising more and more is that um, in order to encourage girls and women to come into the industry, we need to be able to have some role models that they can look to, to see, to see it, because you've got to see it to be it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one of the areas where I think you've done a lot of work in and where you can share some advice with our listeners mm-hmm. uh, in terms of what they could do in their organisations. Okay, so let's let's first of all talk about this word, these two words, role model, because we hear a lot about this need to have more female role models, but we don't ever really talk about what one is. So, you know, what's the definition of that? So from my perspective, you know, you don't automatically become a role model because you're female in a senior position. You're not automatically a role model because you just become the CEO of a biotech company in California. You don't automatically become that because you are in a certain position. It's what you do in that position that makes you the role model so when i talk about role models i'm talking about women that have been there done that 
got the t-shirt. They've not just got the t-shirt, they wear the t-shirt with pride and intention. And so that has a responsibility. You know, that means that you have to be visible and you have to be vocal. You know, you have to be standing up for your gender in that organization or that space. You know, you have to be the person that's leading the pioneer, not a passenger. You know, if you sit silently in your top position and don't do anything about changing the, the kind of landscape, then for me, you're not a role model. You just happen to be somebody that's female that's got to that position. And, you know, you can have somebody that is at the top of their game, that's a CEO somewhere, and I adm admire them for getting there, but it doesn't mean to say that I would want to put them in front of a classroom of 12-year-olds, unless they really, um, you know, understand the difficulties of getting there, and they are working to make those less than for people coming up behind them. Mm. So, you know, they also have to be comfortable in their own skin, you know, so what do I mean by that? Well, you know, there's no point if you've got to the top as a man. There's no point if you've got to the top by behaving like a man, by sacrificing your female, um, you know, sensibility, your female energy, your female skill set, because to get on here, you have to behave like a man. Well, we might as well not bother because it's not an attractive um, philosophy and it certainly isn't going to attract the next generation of female leaders so you, know, you have to be comfortable in your own skin you have to be authentic now we talk about this word quite a lot as well and for me what authentic means is real it doesn't mean that you've got to be perfect and as women we do tend to take things and wear them as a badge and go oh authentic oh authentic now I've got to be authentic I've got to be brilliant at being authentic you know, no, you haven't, because you don't do you don't do authentic. You are authentic. It's something that you 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 are. You don't have to work at it. It's not got a five point plan. It's you know, authenticity is about you being you. And sometimes you being you, some people aren't going to like you. Sometimes you being you is going to upset some people. Sometimes you being you is going to be like, oh, who she thinks she is? You need to be you. Because, you know, that's what being authentic is. And sometimes that means you have to say no. And sometimes it means you have to put your hand up and ask. And these are things that as women were like, oh, not so sure about that one. So, you know, we have to be authentic. Now, my view on role modeling, as you know, Nina, I spend a lot of time in schools and I spend a lot of time introducing role models to girls. So I'm very clear about what that role model looks like before I put her in front of the class. Because, you know, if she's not comfortable in her skin and she's doing things that show she's not comfortable in her own skin and some of her language isn't comfortable in her own skin, I'm very wary because 12 year old girls are very uh, easy easily influenced and so I'm very wary about that so she also has to be courageous and what I mean by courageous is she has to stand up and be counted you know I'm a woman I'm working in an industry where actually there aren't enough of us what am I going to do about it Am I going to just be a passenger and see how far I can get, being quiet, silent, good, obedient? Um, am I going to take on some of those male traits, try and get on, but do nothing about that? Um, am I going to, to sort of take on those male traits, get on, and then change the whole game? Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So, you know, you have to be accountable for doing something about whatever it needs to be done in your industry. And finally, this word that we both love, you have to be a woman of gumption. <laughs> yeah, and you know, that means lots of different things to people, but it, what it doesn't mean is sitting in the corner silently, uh, saying nothing, pretending you don't see anything, and thinking it'll all go away if I don't, if I don't speak. Yeah, so that for me is what a role model is. And I think as women, if we are career women if we are entrepreneur women you know kind of building our own empires or whatever i think we have a responsibility to be that role model mm -hmm. um and you know it's not it's not simply about your position
No, I completely agree. And that's, I think it's a really important definition, Jane, and one which I have to admit I hadn't thought of before. So I think you're absolutely right. Just because somebody has managed to attain a certain position in their career or in the organisation does not automatically a role model make them. No. Um, and, and I can think of some amazing role models in the rail industry, um, but unfortunately, quite a small number you know in and and the rail industry employs there are thousands of people employed in this industry um we still only have just over 16 percent of the thousands that are actually female um which is a is a figure that um, the national skills academy for rail um helped us with um from a survey that they've done uh, in the last um few months so we've got a long way to go we have got some role models who are working very hard and, um, and relatively recently we've got more people within organisations who have got specific responsibility mm -hmm. for diversity and inclusion. And of course that does, does, doesn't mean gender, um, there are lots of other aspects to diversity. Um, inclusion is a whole new subject and one which I hope you and I will cover on a future mm -hmm. podcast, um, but for today we're obviously focusing on gender. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in terms of attracting people into the industry, yeah. um, I think it's fair to say that we are realising that we need to do that earlier. Yeah. Um, it's something that we need to be engaging with schools about at an earlier, at a younger age. And we've got some great people in the network who are doing that. Um, but I'm interested to know what you think, Jane, in terms of how we could be doing that, some practical advice for how we could be engaging with people at a younger age in terms of a career in the rail industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, that's what I do all the time. I take role models from industry, from different professions, um, from different sectors, who've got different backgrounds, who've got, had different journeys, because one size doesn't fit all, some people go through an apprenticeship route, some people go to university, some people go to the University of Life and just get straight into a job at 16, like I did. Um, you know, so, so there's no point in just taking people into school who've got the same journey and the same background. It's about diversity in terms of taking as many different women in, uh, of different ages, different ethnicity, different backgrounds and so on. Um, and putting them in front of young girls because if you don't know what a civil engineer is, if you've never met one, you don't know what one is, you don't know what one does, but when you sit in front of a civil engineer and they show you a model of a bridge that they've built, it's like, I could do that. You could. Yeah, you're good at maths. I'm really good at maths. You could do that. And it literally is like a this kind of bewildered that just opens up their whole world. You know, if you think being a barrister is a job for middle class people and you meet a barrister that grew up on a council estate and she's now one of the youngest female barristers in the country, that changes your game. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, um, you, you meet a female train driver and you thought, oh, I didn't know I could drive a train. That looks really exciting. So we've got to get in front of these girls and we've got to get in front of them young. And young for me is 12, 13, because at 13, they start choosing those options. And they can so easily get in a silo very quickly. They can so easily write off so many opportunities by being very, very kind of narrow in their options. And I'm not saying that at 12, 13, they need to know what they want to do. I thought myself was about 38 till I knew that. Um, but they need to not narrow the game unless they want to be a doctor. And it's a vacation and it's what they've always wanted to do. And the mum and dad are doctors and they, don't, they can't see themselves doing anything else. That's a different, different scenario. But the majority of the girls that we're working with are middle they're middle girls. So these are the girls, these are the untapped talent. This is the, where the untapped talent is because these are the girls don't really know. And these are the girls that don't really get any investment to find out because they're not gifted and talented and they're not falling off the scale the other side as at-risk girls. So this is the big pool. And this is the pool where we need to go and talk to and sort of take our role models. And I was telling you the other day, you know, a very sobering thought <laughs> for me. The first time I went into a school was only about a year ago. And we were talking about role models and I put my role model up on the screen, which is Oprah. And not a single girl in that room knew who she was. 
So I think the other thing we need to be aware of is that our role models are not their role models. And so we can go, well, there's loads of fantastic women out there. I mean, look at Obama, look at the, you know, look at all these fantastic women doing these fantastic things. They're not their role models. And so it doesn't matter how many times you say, well, there are loads of women out there doing stuff. Why can't they see that? Because they're not really interested. You know, a group of girls, even six months ago, only 20% of the room knew who Malala was. You know, so that's not who that they're in a way, a lot of these girls, their world's very small, even though they have got access to this global connection through the Internet, their lives are very small. And so the, the imagery that they're surrounding themselves with and their their role models um, are not surprisingly your reality TV stars, not surprisingly your YouTubers, your Instagram influencers, because that's their world. That's who they're, they're kind of following and talking about. And they also see it as a get rich quick scheme, um, you know, which, you know, they're going to be very sad about when they realize it's not, um, <laughs> you know, but, but that's their world. And so apart from maybe, you know, their mom, if their mom's a working mom, uh, they might have a cool aunt, um, you know that they, they're very limited to the women they actually meet so we need to get into the classroom and be those role models um, much earlier than we have done in the past because in the past I think we would probably go in and get girls to do work experience at 15 16 it's too late we need to go in much earlier yeah I agree completely agree um, I, I did I was talking to, uh, to one of our fabulous role models a couple of weeks ago um, who was talking about when she goes to career fairs yeah. and would stand there with, you know, with all of the, the, the backdrop with the trains on it, etc. And, and people would just walk past because they wanted to go to find out about the automotive careers or the aerospace careers or, you know, so if they, they're engineers in that case, rail just doesn't even appear to be interesting you know so we need to do something about um it making it more appealing generally in competition with those other industry sectors which are seen to be kind of streets ahead in terms of of the the technology the innovation etc there's so much happening in rail there's mm. so much happening and i'm desperate to get that message out but especially to young girls mm. but as you said it's not their frame of reference they don't they're not following network rail on twitter like i am they're not you know they're not looking at stuff on on the internet or reading the rail magazines you know so we need to be more in their face mm. and with people that that look like them people that they could aspire to be mm. but just who happen to be doing a really interesting job i also think we need to be honest as well because the danger is that, you know, we go into schools and I've seen this happen and we tell the girls, oh, you never get a better career in than rail. It's fantastic. You get to do this and you do that. And, you know, and you, you'll go straight into doing all those things. It's a great place to work without really telling the truth about, you know what, you come into rail at this point, you're going to be a pioneer. Because there aren't enough of us. No. And don't come in thinking you're going to be sat with a group of women because you're not. You're going to be one on your own with probably 19 men. And, you know, but that's where we are. And we need women, girls like you to get that. And we need you to come on board and work with us because I think that also we need to be honest with ourselves about that. So there's a difference between what we say and what's actually happening. And you and I have talked about this before. You know, we can have diversity targets. We can, you know, talk about all, you know, have these fantastic opportunities. But actually, in reality, when we look inward, when we look at those organisations, we know they, they work better with women. We know that, that organisations that have a more equal board do better. They do better on their return to investment. They do better share, share capital. They do better in terms of their management of risk. We know that, but we've also known it for about 10 years. Mm. Um, and you know do we see that impact do we see the impact from any of that um, so you know there is still work to be done but who's going to do that work who's going to do it who's going to make those decisions who's going to say uh, you know what? I think that we need to do x y and z or I think that that's not working or so on and and we have to look at um, you know I call we have to look at the structural 
situation, not fix the women. Because what we tend to do all the time, and I've been talking about this for at least 15 years, whenever I go into an organization, they talk to me about, oh, right, well, we need to do something about the women because, you know, they're not this and they're not that and they're not very confident. And, you know, and it turns out it's never anything to do with the women. <laughs> There's, there's masses of female talent in all organizations and it's not weeping in the corner for lack of confidence. You know, it's a structural issue. It's a values issue. It's a societal issue. And it, it, you know, it's something that we need to tackle on a much bigger scale. I mean, I am an advocate of quotas. I have not always been an advocate of quotas. Um, if you'd have asked me maybe even 10 years ago, did I believe in quotas? I would have bit your hand off how dare you <laughs> but to be honest with you we are losing girls we are losing them all the time because they can't see any progress because they can't see themselves because they can't see organizations that look like they're kind of like female friendly because it looks too much like hard work because so many few women make it when they do make it they're like lauded why can't we just make it? Why do we have to, you know, because not enough of us are making it. So for me, I think it's time that we got, we, we, we kind of got a bit legal. We put some different laws in place. Um, I watched a program on, on the UN sustainable goals the other night and I was mortified in the past 15, 20 years, a little progress we've made um, in terms of, um, I mean, I have to get, I, don't, I want to make sure that I quote these things right, but basically 75% um, of parliamentarians are still male, 73% 70, of managerial decision makers are still male, 87% of people around the peace table are male, even though we know that when women sit around that table, they make better decisions, more sustainable decisions. 67% of climate control negotiators are male. Um, and we're gender pay gap stuck at 16%. So, you know, we, we've still got that work to do. And the problem is, I think a lot of us think it's done. A lot of us are going, oh, well, we've got equality now, haven't we? We haven't. No. We absolutely haven't. We, oh, no. we need to keep our foot on the gas because our girls see that. So they see, even in the gifted and talented girls as well, they see, well, you know, it's not that rocking, is it? I mean, you know, I mean, mum's absolutely exhausted trying to work in the corporate sector. And I'm not sure I want to do that. Mm -hmm. I think I'd rather be a YouTuber, you know? Yeah. yeah. We, are, we are a long way off and there's, there is much work to do. Um, for me, what, one of the things, Jane, that I'm really interested to know your opinion on um, is around what can the blokes do? So how can, we, we, we know that what we need to do, and we can be the role models, we can be engaging with girls at a younger age. I think organisations can have that as part of their DNI strategy is to be able to get into education, to talk to people at a much younger point in their, in their school career, in their education, to let them know what's available. And, and by the way, it's not all about trains. There's lots of other things that you can do in the, in the rail industry. Um, there's some really exciting stuff happening around uh, digital transformation. So lots of technology stuff that we need support with. Customer experience has never been as important as it is now. Commercial skills, there's people related stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yes, there's, we need engineers. Absolutely, mm -hmm. we do. Yes, we need trained drivers. But there's a whole host of other stuff mm -hmm. that, 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 that are really interesting and exciting careers. So yes, we need role models. Absolutely, we do. What can the chaps do? How can they, how can they be advocates for the female role models? What's okay, the so th this is a really interesting question, isn't it? This is where my audacious commentators are with provocative. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, again, a little book, tiny little book by Mary Beard. Okay, tiny little book. You can read it in literally two hours. And the quote on the back, from Mary Beard, you can't easily fit women into a structure that's already coded as male. You have to change the structure. Who defines the structure? The men. Yeah. Okay. Who's defining the strategy? Nine out of ten times, the men. Uh, who's putting the systems in place for how that organization works? 80% of the time, men. So 
actually men have a huge responsibility to help change within an organization because they tend to be the orchestrators of that organization because there aren't enough women at the top inputting to that strategy to that structure to the values of the organization so it's about identifying the champions because we've known all of this stuff for as long as I've been working in this set in this in this niche around 25 years mm. we've known all this stuff so we should have nailed it by now but we haven't why because it's still being run by mail now there are some phenomenal guys out there that get this I've met I've met hundreds and hundreds of them who are champions for women who recognize that it's not a, like nice to have this would be lovely to have a nice few pretty women on the board with something to look at wouldn't it it's not a nice to have it's an absolute imperative it's the only way our society works yeah. in balance so and they get that and they're doing some great stuff they are leading some of these changes you know they're championing women they're bringing more women into a senior level they're making sure that women do sit on the task force where we're looking at re-engineering things where we're looking at putting a new system in where we're looking at you know that whole structural stuff um but in, in the main what really fascinates me is if this was reversed we would have, if this was reversed, if men were in the minority, if it was men that were trying to kind of um, get some parity here, we, we would have nailed it by now. Sometimes I think we're a little bit too nice. Uh, not, not happening here, but you know. Um, so I think that we have to find our champions and we have to ask for a place at the table with those champions so that we know that there are you know the, the, that we're not walking into a, a dragon's den that we're walking into a space that we know we've got some allies um, and we need to even simple things like changing the language in an organization can make a huge impact yeah. so if you change the term maternity leave to family leave i mean that makes that changes the whole thing doesn't it so you, know, you can make some very simple language changes you can find your champions but we've got to get away from this fact that there's something wrong with the women because there's nothing wrong with the women. And if you don't look after your women in terms of promote them when they deserve to be promoted, when their hands raised and, you know, they're the best candidate, you will just lose them because they'll go somewhere else. I've had this conversation with so many times with boards where they said to me, you know, we just can't seem to get the women on the board. Why is that? Well, you know, I don't think women want to work at the same pace as men, do they? I don't think women, I think they want to have families or I think they don't, you know, they don't, they don't really get the same thing that men get. And I said, well, there's so many things wrong with that conversation that we just had. But let me just, let, let's just put some facts to that. Let me go away and do an exit poll on the last 10 women that were at a senior level in this organisation ready for a board appointment and you didn't appoint them. Are you happy for me to do that? Oh, yeah, yeah, because, you know, I, I mean, if you can't make it here, you know, whatever, right, okay. And do you know how many times I come back and go 80% of them are now board directors somewhere else? And then they'll say to me, oh, at least their standards aren't as high as ours. You've got to let this go, okay? This is not a talent issue. Yeah. This is not a talent issue. This is not a, you know, a fixing a women issue. This is structural system values. Yeah. You know, if you, if you have family leave or you have paternity leave, and we have now, don't we, this joint, you know, you can take, you know, do you know how many men are taking that up? It's a really low percentage, isn't it? Absolutely. And why would that be? Because we've, we've given them, you know, the, the right to have that. You know, there might be some men that would, are desperate to have that. Mm -hmm. But they know, they know that it will not be seen favourably in their organisation. And they know that all the other guys, they'll be like, oh, God, what are you? You're henpecked, aren't you? Because the values and the kind of, unwritten rules which is what your values are in that organization are not saying that that's what they is the right thing to do yeah. so we might have that but then if we don't have the values that go with it it won't ever happen so we need to shift at a strategic level or not at all mm, completely agree and i think that's back to um it's the structure of the organization isn't it as you've said how it's set up the way we do things around here but it's also the behaviors 
Yeah. And this is something that has to come from the top. And there are so many times we say that, don't we, you know, in business, it ha this has to be led from the top and it can't feel like a campaign or you know they, they we're going to try this for a bit or we're yeah. going you know we've got six months and we're going to do a project on it and we're going to hit this target it has to be part of the value system and therefore the behaviors of an organization and that can only come from one place and that's right at the top and um, the things about the top nina is unfortunately the top doesn't have many women there so they're getting you back to the same issue because the top um you know it has to accept that right we want to do this thing but actually we're all men mm. and what do we know about what women want yeah. so what we need to do is put a task force in place and give it give it the responsibility and the and the power mm. to actually affect this change yeah. so i'm saying to you this is what we want i'm giving you my commitment that we want to get 30 percent board female board members by 2025 mm, mm -hmm. i'm making you accountable for that yeah go and do what you need to do come back and tell me what you need yeah yeah because the guys don't won't, won't always know that no. you know we know what we need yeah. i would guarantee you that group of women will come back within five weeks and go we need this 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 and this yeah. and if the, if the top go fantastic let's get on with it if they go we're not doing that well then don't expect change anytime soon mm. absolutely yeah yeah i so agree and there's so many things that are whizzing through my head now that i could go on for three hours never mind <laughs> half an hour. um one of the things actually that i do just want to mention quickly is that one of the one of the um actions for want of a better word that seems to be working quite effectively albeit only in a small number of organizations so far is reverse mentoring Mm -hmm. where, where the guys at the top have realised that they need to understand what their female workforce need um, or, or actually any, any type of um, diversity within the organisation in order to find out then we're going to engage with those people and reverse mentoring has been working really well where a more junior member of the team mentors the chief exec okay. and the executive board spends time with them talking about what's going on what life is like for them you know kind of sharing that experience of, of yeah what it's like and what the challenges are and what the issues are and what support we would like so so much to do loads and loads to do uh, loads to talk about as always um and i'm always so inspired by your approach and in absolute awe of the amount of information that you have in your head that you can draw on for this subject but obviously having been doing this for 25 years then there is an awful lot of knowledge and experience in there um, that you've gathered so we do need to draw the conversation to a close. We've done our half hour. I very much hope that we can reconvene at a future date and carry on this conversation, Jane. But just for the people who have tuned in to the podcast, um, I'm really keen for you to kind of summarise what you're saying in some kind of call to action for us. What would be the three things that we could do differently um, just to get the ball rolling? Okay, well, I would say as women, we need to be visible, vocal role models. We need to be an advocate for our profession, for our job, um, and do that by going out and talking to young girls, by blogging about our experience, um, so that people can see where we are, they can see what we're doing, they can see that we love it. Not just because we're in a, an industry that's generally stereotypical male whatever one of them is anymore because <laughs> um, they're all merging into one um, you know actually be seen do something about it you know be proud of where you where you are and talk about it and and be vocal the second is i would say have zero tolerance zero tolerance on what we like to call unconscious bias but in reality is sexism and until we start speaking up about that and refusing to be silenced about that um then unfortunately that's not going to change anytime soon um so you know when one woman's harassed in an organization we all are 
and and we can't sit in silence about that we need to you know be be absolute accept no no prisoners um, and the third thing is to help your organization be accountable for its diversity and inclusion strategy particularly that inclusion bit mm -hmm. you know make them accountable step up put yourself on the task force put yourself on the, around the table get involved in it you know be a pioneer not a passenger you know make sure that you're in it you know you will get so much from doing that so be actually be involved because the third thing is when we pass this baton on to the next generation let's not pass on all the stuff that we didn't get around to doing mm. let's not pass on yeah that was too difficult yeah i had a go at that but you know i you know i just you know let's let's pass the baton on let's let's make it worthy a worthy baton to pass on mm -hmm. so let's be bold and let's be brave and let's believe that it's possible. Fantastic. Thank you, Jane. I have thoroughly enjoyed our conversation and I very much hope that we can have another one very soon. Absolutely. Me too. Me too. A huge thanks to Caroline for sharing her thoughts and her own personal insights and learnings from the last few months. The next episode of Intuitive Insights will be with you in two weeks time when I'm joined by Steve White, Chief Operating Officer for GTR.